Hi, hi, Niemann Ha. It's Joey, I'm back. Joey is my last name, me, my first. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Shanghai Kid. Today's topic is Images of Tongue Women in the West, Part 2. Time to restore the images of Tongue Women. In perhaps the only nation in the modern world since the 50s, women in Zonghua commonly use their own surname at work and in public. This little bit of information has never been circulated in the West. When Hillary Clinton went to Zonghua in 1995 for the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women, I remember seeing her on the news talking to Tsonghua women about women's equality. I wanted to laugh because she went as a Mrs. Clinton and the women she was educating were introducing themselves by their own surname, not their husbands as she did. I don't know who these women were, but they could have been women who had carried guns and fought the Japanese in the guerrilla war during the Japanese occupation of Tsonghua. My point is, though with good intention, she went there with the misconception of Tsonghua women. And this is the topic of today's episode, to restore and reclaim the images of Tsonghua women by promoting positive stories. It is a courage and achievement of our women we want to talk about, not the miserable tales of oppression and submission. One such woman was a talented poet, Yi Cheng Zhao. Long before the prolific 19th century American poet, Emily Dickinson, there was another Tsai Nu, the talented woman. In 12th century Zhonghuo, during the Song Dynasty, Li Qin Zhao was a defined visionary at a time when women commonly burned their poems rather than have them read in public. But Li used hers to publicly criticize the government for favoring peace with the Jin in the north instead of fighting them and restoring the Song Dynasty. Li Qinzhao wrote primarily the Ci poetry. With her mastery of the form's metrical rules, she made a name for herself by age 17. Ci poetry is song lyrics. At the time, Shi was treated as ditties written by male writers for dance performances or a sideshow entertainment at banquets. She challenged her male peers and labeled their verses as uninspired and devoid of substance. Her poetry is noted for its striking diction. She focused her Shi on personal experiences giving her work more emotional intensity than that of her peers. She was one of the earliest poets who inspired the scholarly study of Ci. The varying line lengths are comparable to the natural rhythm of speech and therefore are easily understood. Ci eventually became another major poetic form beside Shi. Li Qinzhao was born into a prominent literary family and was wed at 18 to a known antiquarian who shared her passion for collecting books and artifacts. But their marriage was cut short. Her husband died young at age 49, leaving her childless and alone. The warm memory of her first husband led her into a disastrous second marriage. He later branded the man abusive and worthless shyster. A widow who remarried would have raised eyebrows at the time, but she took it a step further into scandal when she divorced him. The legend says she was ostracized after her divorce, but continued invitation to present Si at court suggests 
she might still have held a high status among her peers. Her final years were foggy, with one poet recounting that she wandered about the rivers and lakes until she died. For centuries up until 1957, her independent streak was undermined, and evidence of her second marriage and divorce was covered up and denied. Li Qingzhao produced seven volumes of essays and six volumes of poetry, but most of her work is lost, except for some poetry fragments. But today, her zi that survived were enshrined in textbooks and still ring fresh and true to modern generations. Her refusal to conform to male hierarchy has earned admiration from women across Zhonghua. Here is a sample of how she expressed herself. In life, be a champion among men. In death, be a heron among goats. There's no book that has provided more detail and insight into women's life in the old feudal society than the classic novel, Hong Lo Mong. A Dream of a Red Chamber, which first appeared in the 18th century during the Qing Dynasty. The novel was based on writer Cao Chuqing's own family and revealed how women, both the ladies and the maids, defied society, each in their own admirable way. Though many ended tragically, some had triumphant endings. None were passive or subservient, from what I remember except Shitsun and Yuarjie. But even they realized their own weaknesses and were conscious of their helplessness. Considering the conditions they lived in, they were 100 times more courageous than any of us, we the so-called modern liberated women. Yes, Zhongguo was an oppressive society for women, but so was Western society. Adultery is a good example. And just only a few decades ago, both societies considered adultery immoral. But only the women were punished and cast out from society, while no such condemnation befell men. Just read Stendhal's novel, The Red and the Black. It can't be clearer than Madame de Renal's prediction of her own tragic end. Quote, I am a dishonored woman. I'll be subject to gossip for the rest of my life. I have overstepped the bonds of strict propriety." Unquote. The only difference is that being immoral, the women in Zhongguo could be punished or outcast. In the West, it was worse. Women were condemned as sinners. There was no redemption. They were forever doomed. Yet, why do I see countless books and films in the West referring to Zhongguo women as learning to assert their rights from the West? It implies that this is something new for Chinese women, something we are to learn from the West. This is a most damaging misconception, as it not only reaffirms the stereotypes of Zhongguo women, it is also a degradation to our women's courage and achievement. It implicitly bamboozles our minds like poison in the blood, hard to eradicate. Unfortunately, many of our men and women have swallowed this indoctrination since their school days. Consequently, many such a tale have often been willingly written and told by our own men and women. Don't get me wrong, I'm not here to degrade Western women, but to write the wrong images of our women. In fact, Western women's courageous deeds are also often sidelined. I'm also not saying that Tsongbo women have the equality we deserve, but why do we always emphasize Tsongbo societal inequality? but not Western societies. Are Zhongguo women being deprived of rights? Yes, definitely. But this is a universal problem. We should fight this as a universal problem, 
rather than an isolated phenomenon of one nationality. Simply put, I'm sick and tired of listening to or reading the same insinuation in school books, history books, novels, films, and in media of how Tsongkhwa women are deprived of their rights and how people in Tsongkhwa sold their daughters. Never a story or news of our women's bravery and accomplishments. Always the negative, the pathetic tales, never the positive. Why? Only recently, in 2021, was I glad to see that the United States Postal Service issued a forever stamp. Honorary brilliant nuclear physicist, a Tsongkhwa American, Wu Jianxiong, as the first lady of physics for her significant contribution in nuclear physics during her 40-year career. And in 2022, the United States Mint on a Tsongkhwa American film actress, Anna Mae Wong, by releasing the Anna Mae Wong Quarter for her legacy in the performing art industry. I thank them for finally honoring Tsongkhwa women in America before the world's eyes. This is a good beginning to pay tribute to our women in America, and we hope we will see more in other arenas, especially with media. In conclusion, I wish to emphasize that there are so many legends and historical tales we could tell our children. No more Western portraits of our women and telling our children how subservient their mothers were and how miserable and helpless their lives were. How can our children grow up to be proud of us? How can parents feel comfortable telling them of their past and sharing their experiences with them? No wonder so many parents never talk and refuse to share their past with their children. They feel they will be looked down upon and judged. How many beautiful, valuable stories have remained untold and buried away? This is a big price to pay in the search for identity. Don't ever blindly swallow what others feed you. Know your own roots, for there is a treasure box for you to dig into. And that, in turn, will strengthen your self-esteem and self-worth. Well, I think... Perhaps I should soften my tone a bit. Okay, no more protestation for the time being. How about some personal tales from my childhood days? Would that interest you? Tune in to find out. Until the next episode of Sanghaijin. Thank you for listening and take care. Bao zhong.